Hey, I got it. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight and I hope you enjoyed that networking session. Now we will go into the sponsors and talk a little bit about uh, who we have helping us out before we do it. Uh, let's see, we always like to give uh, honors to Jean Greeno, who was a, a big player in getting the uh, assisted living really rolling nationwide. And unfortunately, we lost him last year. So we, we like to uh, remember him at our meetings. And he was a very instrumental in me getting started in this. Um, next, we have our website. If you haven't been on it yet, uh, if, particularly if you are in Colorado, you want to make sure that you go there because this has got some key links that uh, are very important. Most important, if you're new and just getting started in this, you want to take a look at these two um, spots right here. These are the regulations. So you need to know these like the back of your hand. It's extremely important. Also, we have our Facebook page. This is called Denver ALR, and we encourage everybody to join us. This is, of course, a, a typical social media. We like to see people post and interact on this. And for those of you that sign up through Meetup, we appreciate that. It's very helpful, particularly when we start getting back into live meetings and we can let the restaurants know how many people to expect. Next, we want to talk about our sponsors. And we've got uh, morning, quite a few good sponsors here. Uh, first is uh, the RAL National right. Association. And we have Brian Pinkowski here with us tonight. Brian, would you like to say a few words about uh, the National Association? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, yeah, we're a 30,000 plus member organization, um, even as high as 50, depending on who you count as, uh, as, as the members. And uh, we're doing a lot of different kinds of things right now with respect to our uh, providing services to members, obviously, to provide a discount rates to, to certain kinds of legal services, but we also provide legal and regulatory updates and access to various kinds of uh, um, uh, products and services that, that are beneficial to the industry. Uh, I think right now they're, they're doing something not too dissimilar from what, what's happening tonight in terms of uh, gadgets. Uh, this is not so much about gadgets, it's about anti-gadgets, I suppose. Um, it's a good organization. Uh, if you're part of Verne's group, then you're automatically a member of that organization. So I encourage you to take advantage of the resources. Thank you very much. And good to see you, Brian. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have the Residential Assisted Living Academy. And again, this is a great place. This was a group that Gene started and uh, it trains people on how to run their businesses. So if you are new and interested in this space, this is an awesome place to go and learn about uh, how you can run your business successfully. So we highly recommend the RAL Academy. And you can get to them on the RAL link here on our page that's on our website uh, next we also have anderson legal business and tax advisors and they can help you set up your um, businesses and also they're pretty good for tax advice i recently had them uh, set up a solo 401k for me so they can handle a lot of that basic stuff and um, pretty easy just to run some docs through them there is Assisted Living Marketing, and Peter is with us tonight. Peter, would you like to say a few things? I would. Thank you very much, Fern. I am Peter Verset, uh, purveyor of Assisted Living Marketing. Uh, we primarily do digital marketing for senior care communities. Uh, many who are uh, the most are residential assisted living, and uh, we can do anything from websites to um, Google ad campaigns, and help you with reputation reviews, all that stuff. So um, super affordable and um, responsive and love the industry. So if you need any help, have any questions, happy to assist. Thank you, Peter. And let me give a plug for Peter too. I use him for my websites. He's been an awesome uh, website guy. I've been working with web guys for over 20 years and Peter's been the best I've ever worked with. So I really oh, like nice. having him on our team. And next we will go to Pinkowski Law. And Brian, do you have Michelle here? To... 
no, right now she's working on a project in, in Sri Lanka. She'll be back uh, on the 11th, although we're, you know, I don't hand the devil's playground. So she's still doing a lot of things for people who are having difficulties with um, uh, zoning and, and needing to increase their bed limits around the country. So we've got a number of communities and it's interesting. There's communities around the country kind of play the same old song over and over again. The neighbors fuss about exactly the same thing. And so we, we do a lot of uh, educating of community uh, officials and HOAs about how they can't discriminate against your residents. So that's one of the things that we do nationwide for everybody. We also help with uh, uh, business formation and helping with regulatory defense, which is in, increasingly in Colorado and Arizona is, is a big deal. Uh, they're all about protecting uh, the seniors by uh, punishing the assisted living uh, operators. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're pretty busy lately uh, trying to handle that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, I recommend to all of my operators, whenever they have an issue, to give these guys a call. They've been fantastic. And, you know, adding beds to your assisted living is the easiest way to increase your revenues. So they can help you do that and usually work around some of that red tape that you have to cut through. Thanks, Brian. Uh, next, we have Grand Avenue Business Brokers. That's us at A Better Way Realty. And also at A Better Way Realty, we have A Better Way Funding. We do lease options for group homes so we can help you get in. And it doesn't take a lot of money to get in. We're a lot more flexible than a bank and you have the option to buy your, your facility down the road. So you can get information on that at realleaseoptions.com. And as a brokerage, we have, we've been very, very busy lately. We've got, uh, still we're working through that 43 bed that's out in Grand Junction. We've got a 16 bed available in the West Metro. We have a three pack in Centennial. This is the business only, but there's options to buy the, the real estate on those as well. And all of these houses are within five minutes of each other. So this is a really nice package. Uh, Gene always talked about that three pack. So this is a good one you can just step into. We've got a 10 bed that's available in Northern Colorado. We've got a 10 bed that's real estate only, but it was licensed for 15 beds in South Metro. We've got uh, 86 beds available in Eastern Colorado. And we've got 26 beds in the Northeast of Denver area. So if you need any help buying or selling these, please give me a call. There's my number, and I have also put my number into the chat screen. And next we have the Colorado Association of Assisted, uh, Colorado Assisted Living Association. And Peter, are you speaking for Cala tonight? Well, I think Rachel's here. Rachel, okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. I'm um, on the board for Colorado Assisted Living Association, and we are so happy to be here and to represent uh, a lot of the small assisted livings in the state of Colorado. Um, recently, we've been working on SB 22-154. Um, several of us have been um, working along with Brian uh, with trying to figure out uh, how to help our small industry with some of the regulations coming down the pipeline. And we, we have called many senators, written letters, testified, and it's been, it's been a hard battle. And, and I'm thinking this bill is, it is moving forward. And, um, but we're still here working for everyone and doing our best to make sure our voice is heard and people understand what the small business model looks like. And um, I'm happy uh, as a call a member to help anybody uh, that has any questions about running their business. I've been doing this myself for 14 years and I have been um, an active member of the assisted living advisory committee as well, sitting in on the board and, um, and going through new rules and regulations. So, just know we got a lot of people working for all of us. So thank you. Thank you for letting me chat tonight. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate to get the news from you guys. Um, and sure. Just to mention, I dropped a couple of links there. One is to the bill so you can see where it's at. Right now we need uh, people contacting your um, representatives uh, and 
letting them know that um, your concerns and issues with the bill. And then if you're not on Call's email list for some of this information, I put a link there so you can um, sign up for the email list. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to our presentation. We have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gold to talk about the behavioral management strategies. And um, he has a couple of assisted livings as well. It's uh, interesting, we were chatting earlier that uh, we talked about this deal oh, a year and a half ago and he was able to obtain these. And um, they are, uh, these are mental health, is that right, Jeff? Yes, a mental health population. So that's perfect for tonight's subject. So I am going to stop my share. And if you want to go ahead and share your screen and everybody give Dr. Gold a round of applause. And I'm just going to I'm going to read his bio just so you have a little more detail here. So Dr. Jeffrey Gold is a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania. In his mental health practice, he and his staff of psychologists, psychiatrists, and clinical social workers have provided clinical behavioral services for residents in assisted living, personal care, and nursing homes in several states, including assessment, neuropsychological evaluation, psychotherapy, and behavioral care planning. Credentialed as a personal care home administrator, Dr. Gold is the owner of two personal care homes, Rouse, and has been a member of Residential Assisted Living National Association, Pennsylvania Assisted Living Association, and Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. He enjoys ex his experience in the personal care home field and has taught a regional and national long-term care at uh, national and long-term care conferences. And his facilities are geared to, to residents with psychiatric conditions. All right. Take it away, Dr. Gold. Okay, well, thank you very much, Renee. I appreciate that. And uh, Vern also, I thank you for uh, having me here tonight. And I want to thank everybody who is on the call, of course, uh, or on the Zoom or, or Facebook or wherever you might be. And uh, before I get started, I am going to post a, a copy of the handouts of the slides for tonight. So uh, I just did that on the chat box. Uh, for those who are familiar with it, um, feel free to go on the chat and you'll see the handouts for this evening's presentation. Uh, I am a psychologist. Uh, I am based in the Philadelphia area. And uh, as a psychologist, I have been providing services to nursing homes for a couple of decades. I won't say how many. And also um, assisted living facilities. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, we have something called personal care homes, which is probably what most of you would call assisted living facilities or, or assisted living residences. Personal care homes are licensed facilities, which might be a house with 10 people or it might be a building with 150 people. Uh, and over the course of time, I was uh, heavily into the industry so much to the point that I became a uh, personal care home administrator and uh, have acquired, as Vern said, uh, two facilities. My facilities happen to be in Pittsburgh, which is on the other side of the state. So the commute is a little long. Uh, also, I have a, a book available on my website, goldenwoodservices.com. You're welcome to go on that site. Uh, it sells the book for $15, but if you download a PDF and mail a check-in, we'll, we'll honor a $10 price for you. So that does not even cover the cost of the of, uh, shipping it to you as well as the cost of the book, but I'm happy to do that for everybody who's on tonight. So uh, if you pay electronically, it's $15. As I, I am not the technology expert to change all of that but you're welcome to just download the form, change it to 10 and, and send that in. And we'll be happy to send you a book that covers uh, what tonight's topic is about. Also, just an FYI, I did take Gene Garino's weekend program about two years ago, possibly three years ago, but I hope it wasn't that long ago, which was of course very helpful for me and giving me the confidence to go ahead and get into the uh, business of assisted living on my own. All right, I'm hoping everybody sees a big blue slide on your screens. And so we will go ahead and get started here. The goals for tonight 
would be to understand who are the mental health providers, generally speaking, uh, how to access mental health and behavioral health services to your facility, and then really to focus on managing difficult behaviors. Uh, there was also a mention in my title about gadgets, and I think there were some discussions about gadgets, so to speak, uh, before the program tonight. And gadgets are great. Uh, facilities have come up with all kinds of ways of helping to manage difficult behavior. And I come from a background of nursing homes where the rules and regulations got very strict on physically restraining people or what the federal government was calling chemically restraining people using psychiatric medications. So getting away from the use of gadgets or medications, what I have uh, done was develop other ways of interacting with residents to help manage difficult behavior. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about dementia as well, uh, reducing restraints, as I mentioned, uh, clinical or documentation. And the goal, of course, is to improve the quality of life for your staff, for your residents, and for yourselves. So with that, we will go ahead and get started here. The first thing I wanna talk about is the difference between psychologists and psychiatrists, which so many people ask me and so many people are unaware. So on this slide, I've listed psychology on the left side and psychiatry on the right. The main difference is that psychiatrists are physicians. They've gone to medical school. They have studied the biological basis of behavior and biochemical issues. And of course, uh, having done that, they prescribe medications, which might have hopefully a positive effect on people's mood and behaviors. And psychologists like myself are not MDs. So I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I have a PhD degree, doctor of philosophy, or today many psychologists have a PsyD, which is a doctor of psychology, or an EDD, doctor of education. Uh, psychologists are generally not prescribing medications, although in the states and areas listed at the bottom of this slide, I did show some states that have psychologists prescribing medications as well. Um, both professionals will do an interview and a history, hopefully. Uh, that means a meeting with the resident themselves, uh, doing some formal cognitive testing or some kind of assessment, which I'll get into in a little more detail just to give you some insight as well as hopefully perhaps interviewing the family or getting a what we call a psychosocial history, a lot of background about the person, and we'll get into some of that a little bit later as well. Psychologists will often do a verbal psychotherapy session. So when you see on television or maybe experienced in your, your own family, somebody going to a therapist to talk, that's more of what a psychologist does. Psychiatrists usually have briefer medication visits. And when they come into your facility, if they do, or if your residents go out to see psychiatrists, they're probably gonna have a briefer visit, perhaps a 10 or 15 minute medication check and symptom check, uh, as well as any adjustments to medications that the psychiatrist might do. Uh, behavioral management is something that's more on the psychology side of things than the psychiatrist side of things. So, uh, and there are many residents, uh, especially for those who are involved in a memory care type of facility, there might be many residents who are unable to participate meaningfully in a psychotherapy session, but uh, that's where managing difficult behaviors comes in, in terms of staff interventions and things that we can do to help somebody feel more comfortable and uh, allow their behaviors to be a little more calmer and their mood a little bit better. So accessing mental and behavioral health services, uh, if you are in the Colorado area, which many of you are, of course, uh, some of the local associations had come up on the screen earlier. Uh, what I have here are some more national uh, ways of accessing psychological and psychiatric services. And by the way, in many states, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners might also come into your facilities and provide a prescriptive service, as well as licensed clinical social workers might come in and provide some behavioral or counseling services as well. So on this slide are just some ideas of places you can go to access some of these services. Also, I know from my personal experience, 
if there are groups, uh, group practices in the region that provide mental health services to facilities uh, such as ours, you might be receiving those things in the mail. So you might wanna keep a close eye on the mail that you get. And there might be some behavioral health groups that are advertising their ability to come into your facility, which a lot easier, of course, than uh, having somebody go out to see a, a doctor in their office. So why don't we move on to some of the clinical issues that arise with behaviors. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is dementia. And what is dementia? Dementia is a progressive decline in cognitive functions. And cognitive functions refer to some of the general brain activities, such as memory, concentration, reasoning, expressive speech, being able to express what they need, and uh, behaviors as well. There might be some repetitive behaviors or some confusion. And so that's a general idea of what dementia is. And what we want to do is keep in mind that some symptoms of dementia are treatable and we don't want to immediately jump into panic mode and figuring out how to manage difficult behaviors in some creative way without first looking at some basic uh, uh, concepts within the human body that might be treatable. So sometimes people might have some confusion and some memory loss due to some of these uh, possibilities that are up on the slide now, such as dietary problems or malnutrition, lack of vitamins, minerals, uh, met met metabolism problems or drug interactions, uh, sleep disorders, sleep deprivation might be a problem. Uh, and when somebody lacks sleep for a number of nights, they can also develop cognitive difficulty and even behavioral difficulty. Sensory deprivation, such as loss of hearing, might become a contributing factor as well to what looks like dementia. Sometimes I make recommendations that we have somebody get a hearing exam just to make sure. Also, infections such as urinary tract infections might have a more immediate effect on somebody's cognitive abilities, and we want to make sure that we've had a doctor order blood work or urine work to make sure there's no UTI or urinary tract infection. Arteriosclerosis and stroke, these things uh, prevent blood from getting to the brain. Uh, hypertension might be a precursor, uh, that's high blood pressure. There could be tumor, there could be a delirium, which is a more of a medical state caused by any of these things that we mentioned here. And even depression or depressed mood might contribute to loss of concentration and some cognitive decline. So it might be treatable by treating depression. So we wanna make sure that we're treating things or we're examining some gotcha. things uh, that, have, that might have a positive effect on some of these symptoms once we're able to treat them. Uh, on this slide, what we see are some untreatable things. And we, I use the word untreatable um, because dementia such as uh, dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease and some of these other diseases listed here are certain kinds of dementias where there may not be a cure. Uh, there may be medications that can help relax the symptoms or help stop the progression of the disease. But if somebody has these diagnoses, they might become a little bit more of a behavioral challenge that we will have to work with with some of the ideas that we'll talk about tonight. Uh, why do they act this way? Uh, sometimes there is a frustration or a concern or a worry that they might be unable to communicate well. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy was mentioned um, and Maslow's hierarchy refers to different aspects of life from the most basic to the more advanced as uh, human beings. So we start with basic needs like food and water and sleep and comfort. And we tend to focus when we have dementia on the first two here. Uh, those are some basic issues that might 
be contributing to behavioral disturbances and that might help us be able to manage the behaviors better. Also, we might start to take a note of situations that are going on around the resident who might be having behavioral challenges. So you might wanna make a note of any patterns that are going on, such as what time of day does something tend to happen? How much light or darkness is there, either from sunlight or even within your home? Uh, change of shift can be a bit noisy and full of activity, which might stimulate and agitate some people who are dealing with confusion. Uh, scheduling of meals and baths. Uh, what we found is when people have their meals and baths or showers at a time that they're used to having uh, when they were younger, this might reduce some agitation as well. Uh, sometimes people tend to act out habits and routines. They're used to going home and cooking or going to work, especially at that sundown time in the later afternoons. And uh, that's a time period that often causes confusion and difficult behavior. Uh, in addition, we find that people tend to act out some hobbies or some things they used to do. Uh, I've had people who were uh, housekeepers and actually somebody who was a plumber would go into sinks and fill them up and spill them out and we kind of have to keep cleaning up after them. And so we're able to get creative and recreate some of their uh, jobs and some of their hobbies for them in a way that works in our facility. So we help occupy their time with something they're familiar with and able to do and makes them feel good. Sometimes they will have behaviors because of psychotic processes. And this is where the psychiatrist uh, might come in handy. Um, they might have some of these symptoms here. Uh, a delusion, by the way, is a false belief. A hallucination is a false perception, such as seeing things or hearing voices or hearing things. Illusions refer to a misperception. For example, hearing a door slam and yelling, everybody get under the tables they're attacking uh, because they might have thought the door slam was something that triggered a war memory or something to that effect. And paranoia really falls under delusions, in my opinion. Uh, paranoid thoughts are thoughts that people are going to harm me, such as um, I'm not eating this food, they're trying to poison me, or I'm not taking these pills because they're trying to poison me. And fear and anxiety might cause some behavioral difficulties, as well as uh, sleep disturbance, as I said earlier. People who are depressed are also ex uh, might experience cognitive declines. Uh, if you have severe depression, you might experience psychotic symptoms such as those we just discussed. Uh, you'll have sadness of mood. You might have a poor appetite or you might be overeating. You might have difficulty sleeping or you might be spending too many hours in bed, not wanting to get out of bed. You might have uh, refusing a lot of activities. Uh, and isolating oneself. And of course, people do experience a lot of loss. Uh, people, even in the nicest facilities, feel a sense of loss of their home, uh, maybe not being in touch with their families as much as they used to be, and loss of career, loss of independence, uh, loss of some freedoms, and so forth. So that can cause us to feel somewhat depressed as well. So when we are experiencing or our residents are experiencing these things, what is the effect on the caretakers as well? So our residents are struggling, but that might cause a little bit of a struggle in our caretakers. Some caretakers might feel angry or fear. Uh, sometimes it's hard to separate taking something personally, such as abusive language that a resident might um, use in talking to staff or just a resident might be repetitive in their requests or their uh, activities. And so staff members might feel angry. They might feel fear or being afraid. Uh, staff members might have higher expectations of somebody than that person is actually able to do. And I, I run into that a lot as well. When somebody looks like they're doing pretty well, 
but underneath what looks like high functioning, they might not be functioning that well cognitively and staff might be a little confused by that. Uh, and so of course, staff might experience a bit of frustration. So those are some of the uh, background uh, actions that might be going on with residents that might cause some uh, fear and upset in staff as well. So the question is, what can we do? So let's take a look at what some of the things are that we can do to manage challenging behavior. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of treatable things out there. And so we wanna make sure that the residents have seen a doctor, a physician, or that they see a physician uh, as frequently as it seems appropriate. Sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's annually, depending on your state or your situation. Uh, we want the doc hopefully to rule out anything that's treatable or to treat what's treatable and uh, to make sure that if what we're working with, they've tried everything on a medical basis and are therefore uh, we're left with what might not be a medical uh, situation so that we might have to be a little more creative on the behavior management side. Some of the things that, that a physician might look at are vital signs, what medications a person is on. Uh, they usually do a very basic mental status check. They may look at sleeping habits, bowel and bladder habits, food intake. Uh, they'll, of course, do blood and urine analysis, look at skin, uh, swellings, injuries, range of motion, uh, abdominal issues, uh, whether the person is having catheters. Uh, they might want to look at, make sure there's no urinary tract infections going on. Now, more on my side of the uh, field, the psychosocial assessment, and this is very important. I recommend, uh, regardless of whether your regulations require this or not, this is a fantastic thing to do to get to know your resident well, not only to make them feel at home, but to use this information either in the present or in the future if behaviors become challenging for you. So a good family history of their family of origin, that is when they were children, what family they were born into uh, and what some losses, if any, were, and also what their later family is when they perhaps married and had children. Also a work history, an educational history, getting a history of their likes and dislikes, what they have done, what they enjoy doing, hobbies, routines, and habits. Routines and habits might include what time of day they like to bathe or shower. Uh, do they prefer baths or showers? And um, any other daily routines or habits that they are used to doing. Past behavioral history, that is, have there been any behavioral challenges in the past? Of course, any mental health challenges in the past, you wanna ask the resident and or their family. Um, do they have problems with pain? Chronic pain is often an underlying contributor to behavioral challenges, and we'll get to that also in a few moments. As well as the environment that they're moving into, um, are they used to having a roommate? I remember they were living in a home with their families, or maybe they were living alone or living with their children. Now they're going to be living with uh, in, a, in a new uh, facility, and they might have a roommate. And having a roommate is a very difficult thing to have. Uh, also, if there's remodeling going on or any other uh, more noisy activities going on. So you might have a psychologist in there doing a neuropsychological assessment as well. And that would be more of a cognitive assessment. What works, what doesn't work in terms of a person's cognitive or mental abilities and how can we make best use of that information? So I'll give you a little bit of insight there. I don't expect you to do neuropsychological assessments, but just having a little bit of information about it might help you, um, uh, might help you do a more formal or more uh, comprehensive assessment. So we look at some very basic things such as, can they pay attention, concentration, orientation? Are they oriented to who they are? They know their name, they know where they are, they know the city, the type of facility they're in. Do they know what time of day it is or roughly is it in the afternoon? Do they know the situation they're in? 
Uh, do they know the date, the year? Do they generally know who is the president, which most people know, and they have known at some point in time in their lives if they don't know um, currently, if there's been uh, past uh, injuries, past traumatic events in their lives, um, and what might trigger those events as well. We look at short and long-term memory if we're going to do a full-blown cognitive assessment, abstract reasoning, judgment, flexibility, um, verbal versus performance, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about, but I, I actually like to talk more about encoding recall and recognition. What that means is, uh, and by the way, you might wanna write this down, the word BIMS, B-I-M-S, stands for, um, actually, I don't remember what it stands for, but it's on the internet. It's a very basic cognitive test I use every day in nursing facilities. And it's, it's right there online if you wanna look that up. That's a very basic cognitive assessment. When somebody can recall words, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll read off three words to them and ask them to recall them in a few minutes. They may not be able to recall those words, but if I ask them other words with the three words embedded in it, they may be able to recognize. So recall versus recognition might be a good key to how we're gonna manage difficult behavior that might show us a cognitive strength that they have. We also look at speech uh, and how well they're able to express their needs. Expressive speech versus receptive speech means, and this, this gets us to that uh, example where staff might think that somebody can do better than they are, or that somebody is being manipulative, so to speak. Receptive speech refers to your ability to understand me, and expressive speech refers to your ability to speak and express your understanding. A lot of times people have receptive speech but they're unable to get their own words out. We find that they have a word finding difficulty. It might be one of those tip of the tongue types of syndrome where you guys kind of know that. Uh, I just can't figure out how to tell you. And so we might also want to ask them yes or no questions rather than ask them open-ended questions. So how are you feeling today is an open-ended question. Are you feeling okay today? Is more of a closed question, it's a yes and no answer. And if they have difficulty expressing themselves, we might wanna keep our questions very simple. Also asking what would you like for breakfast might be a very challenging question, but asking would you like eggs or would you like cereal might be easier for them. That's sort of a multiple choice question. Or even would you like eggs this morning? and let them respond with a simple yes or no. Sometimes people are able to respond better to a visual, like a picture, rather than uh, a word. For example, I had somebody who refused to allow us to wash their clothing. And every time staff tried to take their clothes out of the room to bring it down to the laundry room, they would have a big battle. And we tried explaining to the resident what was going on with the clothing. And finally, uh, I discovered that their visual spatial ability was much better than their verbal ability. So we showed them pictures of washers and dryers to explain where their clothing is going and that it'll be brought back. And that reduced a lot of the uh, resistance. And eventually we allowed them to sit by the washing machine while their clothes were being washed and that reduced a lot more resistance. So there are a lot of creative things that we can glean from doing a good assessment. So the key points, does the person understand more than it seems, more than they appear to be understanding, or do they understand less than they appear to be understanding? And a second question as a very traditional behavior modification question, do they have enough cognitive function to understand stimulus and response? I won't get into too much psych, psych 101 technical, uh, technological verbiage, but we'll talk about a behavioral management plan that includes some of that basic psychology. 
So if we have somebody with challenging behaviors, one thing we need to first do in creating a plan to reduce the challenging behaviors is to figure out what are those behaviors. For example, I'm going to go over a few, actually a few examples of specific behavioral language versus general labels. In fact, I'll move ahead uh, just to show you what I mean. If we label somebody as depressed or sad, that doesn't get to how can we help them. But if we label behaviors or descriptions of behaviors, such as they only come out of bed one time a day, they tend to refuse meals twice a day, they tend to be crying more often, you can see we're giving more measurable, measurable behavioral examples of a behavior so we can address the behaviors a little better and actually we can figure out how to reduce those behaviors and increase more positive behaviors. So more specific behavioral language helps us to maximize the clarity on a care plan, which I'll show you in a few minutes as we move along. Uh, it'll meet regulatory compliance if people like to come into your facility and, and read your records. Uh, it'll maximize the treatment and hopefully maximize the effectiveness of a behavior management plan and maximize staff, staff involvement. Specific behavioral language should describe the behaviors and symptoms, like the example I just showed you, and not just be a label. So again, if we look here, if a label is depression, it's better to use descriptions of what they're doing or not doing than to just label depression. Similarly, if we just say that somebody's been angry or somebody is abusive or somebody is agitated, that doesn't give us much information. And when staff refer somebody to me in my role as a psychologist, because somebody's been agitated, I'll ask them, what are they doing? Give me some examples of what is this agitation? Pacing, yelling at staff, shaking, being awake until three o'clock in the morning and so forth. So these are more specific behaviors that we are noting instead of labeling them. Another aspect of behavior language is frequency, duration, and intensity of those behaviors. So how often is the behavior occurring? What is the duration? How long does it last? Does it last for minutes, for hours, for weeks? And how, intensity, how intense is the behavior? Are they yelling out so much that it's affecting the entire home? Are they affecting their entire hallway? Is it just affecting a roommate? How much are they doing it or how hard are they hitting people? Are they really injuring people or is it just the more of a light type of uh, slap if they're doing that and so forth? So frequency, duration and intensity go along with those behavioral descriptions that I mentioned a few slides ago. Also, additionally, we might want to note some of these situational factors and maybe develop a pattern that we can say and almost predict somebody's behaviors. Situational factors like time of day, is there a certain staff present when a behavior is occurring? So perhaps a staff member looks like a child of theirs or somebody who perhaps passed away or, or represented something to them. Uh, are they behaving in a certain way when family comes to visit or when family leaves, which is often the case. There tends to be some agitation when family leaves. Also, we really need to know about pain and whether they're experiencing pain. Uh, are they feeling warm? Are they feeling cold? Are they hungry? Are they thirsty, lonely? Is it too noisy? All of these things might contribute to challenging behaviors. And these are good to note when we see behaviors, um, as well as what we call sundown syndrome, which I mentioned earlier happens usually in the late afternoon. Uh, it's beginning to get dark. They may not see as well in the dark. They might be misinterpreting things or experiencing fear or insecurity. So given all those possibilities and all those things, once we have assessed what are the problem behaviors, let's take a look at what to do about it. 
So the first thing we're going to look at is actually during a behavioral crisis, somebody's yelling, screaming, uh, wanting to go out the door. What do we do? The one thing we don't do is we don't want to gang up. So what I often see is somebody is having a behavioral disturbance and all the staff members come running because they want to be helpful. They want to prevent somebody perhaps from going outside of the building. So what happens? Well, imagine that you are somebody who's experiencing confusion or fear or a psychotic process. And all of a sudden, all of these people are running at you at the same time. Do you think that's going to make you any calmer? Uh, I, would, I would guess not. So, so having a gang, uh, or I should say a group of uh, staff members who come running is not the answer. So we need to de-escalate a person's behavior or a person's mood. We don't want to escalate it and feed into it and make it worse. So take a look around you, uh, make sure you have an escape plan. Um, some people make a mistake if somebody is in a, a very agitated mood of having that person end up between the staff member and the door. So the staff member is sort of stuck there and held hostage. You wanna know that you have an escape plan as a staff member and stay at arm's reach. So staff safety is of course important as well. You wanna approach people from the front. And this is true probably for everybody, not just for somebody having a behavioral disturbance. Let them see that you're coming. You don't wanna sneak up on people. Uh, that scares them, especially if they've experienced uh, past traumatic events in their life. You tap somebody on the shoulder from behind, uh, that's not the way to go. So you wanna walk around them and let them see you approaching. You don't wanna confront people or argue or tell them, no, that's not true. I remember we had somebody very late uh, stage of life in their 80s or 90s wanting to leave the building to see the parents. The parents were, of course, deceased for a long time. The person was confused and staff would say, well, your mother's dead. Well, imagine somebody who's very agitated, who believes that she's going to leave and see her mother was just told her mother was dead. And if that happens every five minutes because of forgetfulness, that only serves to agitate and make a bad situation worse. So we don't want to confront or argue. We don't want to accuse somebody of something. We don't want to shock them with news such as what I had just said. It makes no sense to be yelling at our residents. And don't say don't, because that's not going to help either. Don't do this. Don't do that. Calm down. Uh, those things don't work. So what does work? Uh, when there's a crisis going on. And again, how do we de-escalating de the situation? So use a calm voice, reassuring, and paraphrase what they're saying. That means restating what they're saying so they hear that you hear and understand them. You're not arguing with them. You're being a friend. You're building a quick rapport with them right then and there during the crisis. Pretend to be in their shoes and imagine what they're thinking. Matching and mirror, if that's a possibility, that refers to, uh, that's actually, I think, comes from sales possibly, but if they are uh, sitting with their arms folded across their chest, you might want to gently, slowly fold your arms to meet with them uh, and to do what they're doing, because eventually you might want to unfold your arms and see if they follow your cue and unfold their arms. Be at eye level, which means if they're at a wheelchair, you want to bend down a bit, um, and uh, again, being, being at their eye level. And if you touch them, and I, I generally don't uh, do them, but once in a while, just a nice gentle touch on the arm like a loving person might do is okay. Sometimes you can paraphrase what they're saying. For example, I wanna see my mother. And instead of saying, well, you can't, or your mother's dead, is to say, really, uh, sometimes I feel that way too. Tell me about your mother. Start a conversation about it. Distract them from the crisis by beginning a conversation about it. You can even bribe them. How about if we get a cup of coffee, get some, get some food, get a snack? Uh, somebody mentioned uh, validation techniques earlier uh, or uh, in one of, our, uh, one of the breakout rooms, Naomi File, F. 
E-I-L is a name of a lady who wrote a lot about validation techniques, which is similar to what I'm describing. And don't force reality. There's been a debate in our field a lot about should we just hit people with reality? Uh, I say no. Uh, I say just use these techniques not to deny reality. We're not saying your mother is dead or not dead. We're just reminiscing and engaging you in a conversation about your mother. So those are some things to do in a crisis situation. Now let's talk about a more traditional behavior modification, which happens over the course of time. How to guide somebody into a better place, into a calmer, happier mindset or mood over the course of time uh, in a way that would decrease the undesired behavior and increase the desired behavior. So this gets a little bit more technical. That's the Psych 101, which we're going to convert into language used in a residential assisted living. I use the seesaw model here to describe the situation that when we only talk about undesired behavior, we're only looking at half of the story. And if we talk about how do we make these behaviors go away, that's pretty difficult without talking about what do we want to develop? What types of behaviors do we want to see and engage them uh, in, in, and involve them in? So we want to increase desired behaviors, decrease undesired behaviors, or we want to substitute behaviors for those uh, undesirable behaviors, which is similar to increasing more positive behaviors. So tools to increase desirable behaviors, uh, such as reinforcement and so forth. And we'll get to that in a moment, but what, what I also wanna say about desirable behaviors is when we have a list of the problem behaviors that I showed you earlier, such as agitated or combative or depressed, think about what do we want to see and what are we going to do about developing those behaviors? So for example, when we see somebody who is doing something well, like watching TV peacefully or socializing well, why not offer them a little bit of attention, praise? Hey, Mary, it's really good to see you sitting out in the living room. I'm so happy, uh, rather than her being in the bedroom. Or offering some food or snacks. So how about, would you like a cup of coffee or would you like a piece of cake? Or something, of course, that's in their dietary plan. So reinforcing the positive behavior is a basic technique that is something that we need to be thinking about. Staff usually don't think about and analyze, here's the problem, what am I doing to possibly contribute to the problem? I wanna catch myself falling into those traps we talked about earlier, and what can I do to guide the person and reinforce the positive behaviors. And uh, in, in Psych 101, for those who had it, continuous reinforcement means each time positive behaviors are going on, we want to offer some reinforcement. And intermittent means sometimes uh, we'll offer reinforcement. I think that's a little bit more technical than we need to get into. Prompting and shaping behaviors, again, is, is helping somebody realize, well, why don't you come out? in the living room and chat with Joan for a few minutes. I think you'd be happier doing that. Uh, and shaping behavior is breaking a, a challenging behavior like, like participating in a shower or a bath. It's breaking it down into small steps so that um, this, the first step might be in undressing and preparing for a bath. And undressing might mean, let's just focus on removing a shirt or slacks or what have you breaking a task down into small parts and thanking the person as we go for helping out and participating in that. Reframing to the positive. Well, what would you like to be doing right now? I see you're, you're kind of in an agitated mood right now and I wanna help you feel better. How can I help you do that? And again, think about their cognitive ability. What would you like to do? Might be a little bit too open-ended. Whereas, would you like to watch television or would you like to take a nice cold drink of water? Giving them choices. Reinforcing incompatible behavior. So a behavior of yelling is not compatible with the behavior of being calm. 
So how do we reinforce the being calm? So we think about the problem behavior, think about what is the opposite behavior or an incompatible behavior. Also, I mentioned earlier in that history that we take, uh, we learn about their former uh, working experiencing, uh, working experience, their activities. Uh, how can we help them recreate some of those roles? Uh, doing horticulture in the house, helping fold laundry, uh, whatever it is they might have been doing, drawing, coloring, reading, things that they might have used to do. Let's see if we can engage them in those behaviors as well. Increasing desirable behavior might happen also when we figure out what schedules that they are used to, again, from that history. Do they like to take a walk? Do they like resting? What activities? Remember to ensure that their senses are at the best they can be. So they're wearing their glasses, they're wearing their hearing aids, um, they're used to staff. I, I have same staff here uh, in today's market, unfortunately, uh, many places have a high turnover of staff, which can be challenging as well. Um, but if there's some con consistency in staffing, that is helpful. Of course, we don't want to yell or punish, uh, get angry at people. That's not the way to go. Uh, and in most of our, so I'm sure in most states, that's not a, a, a legal thing to do either, but we, we don't want to go into a negative uh, area or negative methodology. So those were examples of increasing positive behaviors. Remember that seesaw, when we focus on increasing the positive behaviors using those tools, we can look at the, the undesired behaviors and focus on that a little bit too in our planning. So for example, if we notice things like eye contact or repetitive movements, we might learn that there's a pattern here that when somebody starts looking away from us or tapping their feet a lot, they're heading down a bad way. And how can we stop that or redirect them into a more positive state of being? Reinforcing the trigger. So figuring out the trigger what is bothering them? And again, it goes back to that history or looking at the situational variables and trying to change those things. So in Psych 101, we call that extinction. Um, therapeutic seclusion, uh, that's a little bit older language. Ober refers to older nursing home regulations. Again, we can't punish people. But if somebody's in an overstimulating environment, a lot of activity is happening in the living room, dining room, kitchen area. It's a lot of noise, a lot of people. Well, maybe you would just like to go into, into your bedroom and maybe sit on the chair and watch a little TV there. It's a little quieter for you. So a change of environment, having them correct some behaviors that they might have done might be helpful, actually. Uh, for example, that plumber who likes to create a mess, uh, maybe that plumber might be willing to, to try to help fix the mess. We can't make people do things. That's probably... Uh, against regulations, but we can just involve them somehow in the actions of, of helping to clean up if, if there was an issue that was created by them. So we want to combine removing triggers or decreasing the undesired behavior, as well as at the same time, rewarding the desirable behavior and creating the desired behavior. So it's that seesaw not only are we pushing down on one side, but we're going to push up on the other side and really strengthen that behavioral plan. So we focus on increasing the desired behavior rather than the negatives of looking at the negative behavior. This is typically more effective to provide a more warm, loving, active environment rather than to uh, look at the negative behaviors and just trying to get them to stop doing that. So it's more effective. Also, again, we have to be careful about residents' rights. We really wanna focus on raising the seesaw on the positive side. It's humane, it feels good. Uh, it feels good to us, it feels good to the residents. Maximizing effectiveness. Um, again, this type of uh, activity takes time to develop. It takes consistency through all staff and all shifts. Uh, if we can praise and reward, and give attention to people when they're doing the positive behavior, it's more effective. And also when our plan meets their cognitive ability. So as I said earlier, if somebody has very poor verbal skills, 
but pictures and spatial and imagery work better. Let's work that into how we're going to help deal with the behavioral problem. Remember also uh, for every, what we learn in um, back in science class, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I view for every behavior, there's an equal and opposite behavior. So for every negative behavior, there's, there's some equal and opposite positive behavior out there waiting for us to find it, prompt it, strengthen it, and develop it. And that's how we can get away from the negative behaviors in a more positive approach. So be reassuring uh, using simple commands or simple instructions for them, yes or no questions, sometimes nonverbal behaviors using gestures, using pictures, uh, speak in a low pitch voice, sometimes, especially for people who are hearing impaired. Uh, if they're like me, they're losing their uh, ability to hear more higher pitches, higher frequency sounds. Uh, and remember, stand in front, let them see you. Don't sneak up on them. Don't startle them. Uh, speak clearly. Uh, don't touch them without explaining first what you would like to do if you're in the process of bodily care. Ask them uh, if, they, if you can help them. Can I help you clean this part? Or can I, um, can I help you remove this soiled shirt or what have you? Lots of smiles, lots of hugs. We're creating an emotional feeling for them, especially if the cognition isn't working very well. We wanna create an emotional feeling of warmth and safety and comfort rather than um, what, what else it might be. And uh, don't get frustrated. Don't take it personally if they're verbally nasty to you. I'm sure they don't mean to be and they probably weren't this way when they were younger. Uh, remember, there's no cure. We're all in it together and we simply want to help manage their behavior together as a team and you can include their family as a team. So I see Vern is on. I may have run over a little bit. I apologize. Uh, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Absolutely. We do have time for questions. I find that very interesting. That was a lot of information and it's very parallel to uh, memory care. Uh, a lot of that, I, I've seen the same things in memory care. So great stuff. Do we have questions from anybody? I have a question, Dr. Gold. Um, thank you. This was really what I needed to hear today. Um, we've been dealing with a, a specific resident at our facility and I haven't dealt with mental health in a long time and he has a pretty significant diagnosis, but um, it's really hard uh, um, to, we, we had a therapist work with us in February, but um, at what point do we think that maybe, because we, we did get some tools pretty much, um, I, I really appreciate some of the tools that you just presented in this um, presentation, but um, at what point do we, we start seeing patterns starting? We, we saw his behaviors, um, they didn't seem to um, appear as close as they are now. It seemed like we were going weeks before we started seeing behaviors uh, or he would go into a state and we were trying to be encouraging, reassuring. And now we're starting to see these behaviors occur almost weekly or sometimes even twice a week. And at what point do we think, I mean, to me, my gut feeling says maybe we need to reassess and look at medications to see if there's something that um, he's plateauing on, he, it's not working, you know. Um. Sure, and, and the, first, the first thing I, I would say, which I did this evening as well, is I always wanna get a medical exam before we go right into psychiatric. Uh, yeah. One thing I didn't say, and may or may not be the case here that you're presenting, if somebody appears to be changing fairly quickly, uh, such as becoming confused or angry or changing personality or cognitive ability fairly quickly, like over the course of a day or a couple days, to me, that's, that strikes me as a much more of a medical problem that might be treatable. Um, it could be a host of anything going on. Often it's a urinary tract infection, which by the way, can make people very, very confused 
and uh, if I may use the word crazy, and when they are treated, they're back to their old selves, and they even remember, wow, how crazy I was acting when I had that uh, UTI, urinary tract infection. So you want to check out any medical situation that might be going on. There are other ones that I didn't mention in the earlier slides, like an organ failure or kidney problems, toxins in the body, and so forth. So check those things out first. Uh, again, talk to family, get a, get a good background uh, as uh, some of the slides uh, help guide you on and uh, try to work on the behavior management. Uh, it is possible that having an outpatient psychiatric visit and maybe there are medications that would be helpful might be the next step uh, as well as a verbal therapy if they're able to, to participate meaningfully in that. Another question. Why is it so difficult when we're thinking about, because I know his family puts the stigma. I think there's some also some um, external situations that also flare up his behaviors. And I tell the family, don't call. <laughs> and it's just the way it is. You know, I feel like that might be a trigger. But at the same time, if we're looking at inpatient, because I've been told they've tried doing medication tweaking but then he'll spiral out of control. And to me, I'm like, that's giving me a stigma and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to be a mess. But at the same time, I'm looking at outpatient um, places and you put mental health diagnosis on top of dementia on anything. And it's almost impossible to get him in anywhere. Do you understand why that's the, re what's the reasoning on that? Uh, well, you're, you're talking about one of the most difficult kinds of residents, which uh, my facilities, uh, given who I am, uh, are focused on psychiatric, people with psychiatric histories. Uh, and we do have problems ourselves sometimes uh, when it comes time to hospitalize somebody because their behaviors are so out of control or uh, potentially harming themselves or harming other people. Um, I think even psychiatric hospitals have a difficult time with that or else uh, I've seen many times where they'll medicate people uh, if they go back to a facility or a nursing home that tends to reduce the medications either by regulations or by the philosophy of the home. And then the hospital says, you know, we keep medicating, you keep unmedicating and you keep wanting to send them back here. So we don't wanna take them anymore. Um, difficulty with managing psychiatric symptoms and behaviors to the point where they require inpatient care is a whole world in itself. And I, I know it's very frustrating. Um, I find too that residential uh, assisted living, people who are not in need of nursing homes, but they're just in need of the supervision and the structure of an assisted living facility can be very resistant to mental health care. Uh, perhaps it's that old fashioned stigma uh, I find when I'm asked to come into these facilities, the residents more often than not don't wanna to talk to me as compared to nursing homes. 30 years ago when I started, they, they didn't want to, but uh, today they're, they're, they're much better at being patients, willing to talk to me more. So the stigma that a resident and the family might have with regard to providing a mental health service to their loved one, uh, that's still around. Uh, hopefully the generations are, are moving away from that. Any other questions? Welcome. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Gold. That was fantastic. And wow, that is so much information. Well, thank you. Uh, we really that. appreciate that. This, if, if you missed any of this or didn't absorb it the first time, we are going to put this on the website, the recording and the slides. So you could always go back and listen again. Um, we ask that you put your information into the chat screen. And then where you put your info in, there's that little button on the right side with three dots. And you can click on that and save the chat. So be sure to do that before you leave. Um, I am going to take over the screen here just so that we can wrap it up. Uh, next, we have haves and wants. So if you have a service or need something, um, if you're, this is an opportunity, if you're looking for partners, 
you have something you want to tell the group, here's your opportunity. Does anybody have any haves or wants they would like to share with the group? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody jump out here. <laughs> I'll, I'll say something. Okay. Um, we are looking for staffing in our uh, assistant homes. Um, if you guys know anybody or anywhere for staffing, we are uh, looking for staffing. All right, so Muhammad is looking for staffing. Muhammad, do you have your information in the chat screen? I think, yeah, I have put it there. I'm not sure if I had anything there though. Okay, yes, I do see your email in there. Okay. And uh, just a, again, a reminder too, that we'd like to see your email and phone number in there. Uh, and it's always nice to see where you're from because our group has kind of grown. Uh, so we do have a few people from across the nation, that, not just Denver. So with that, um, I'm going to step aside. This is where we end our meeting, but you are welcome to network share with anybody. Uh, I leave this open. We'll stop the recording and we leave this open so that we can network. And we just you know, close it up once the last person's gone or if there's no more activity. So thanks everybody for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Gold, for sharing your knowledge with us. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to hang out, maybe Dr. Gold will answer a few more questions. Um, but I'm going to sign off, and it's good to see you folks. We will see you next month. Yeah. <clears throat>